Cause, a copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 243 regarding a missing person. Cooperate with the district attorney investigators. That is all. Norton. This story you are about to hear is one in which there was no apparent crime. There was absolutely nothing to indicate to investigating officers that a crime had been committed. Nevertheless, there developed one of the most cleverly planned crimes of its kind on record. But like all criminals, the perpetrator of this deed miscalculated just enough to upset his own plan. How he did this has been reserved for the end of the program. Now, the authenticated story taken from law enforcement files. A murder has been arranged. On an April day several years ago, Captain James Bean, head of the Homicide Squad, looked up from his desk to greet a visitor. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I need your help. All right. That's what we're here for. What seems to be the trouble? I'm Dr. Young. Yes? I want you to help me find my wife. Go on. She's disappeared, and I can't locate her anywhere. Frankly, I'm not much worried about it because she's been writing to me quite regularly. Then why are you coming to the police? Well, her father's been making statements that I know where she is. Do you? No, I don't. He's even gone so far as to insinuate that I've killed her. And I want you to help me find her. Well, this doesn't quite make sense. You say your wife has been writing to you, and yet you don't know where she is. Well, that's true. She's written me several letters, but she never gives any street address. Just who is your wife's father? Frank H. Lunt. Oh, I see. When did your wife disappear? Well, it was on the night of February 22nd. That was Washington's birthday. We went out to the plantation inn. We were going to celebrate. Are you flirting with that girl? Eh? What girl? Now, don't be evasive. You know what girl. That blonde hussy across the floor. Why, no. She's a patient of mine. Oh, a patient of yours. <laughs> a likely story. It isn't enough that you try to carry on affairs with all my friends. But you've got to try to flirt with every pretty face you see in a nightclub. You're being unreasonable. Is it unreasonable to ask that you pay attention to your own wife? Stop making a fool of yourself. But I'm not making a fool of myself, I tell you. The woman is a patient of mine. If you tell me that lie again, I'm going to slap your face. Well, it's the truth. <sighs> oh, come on. Take me out of here. Gladly. Oh, I was never so humiliated in my life. Where are you going? I'm going to the Biltmore. But aren't you going home? No, I'm not going home. Couldn't stand to look at that face of yours and nothing. So I drove her downtown. I tried to pacify her as well as I could, and after a while she seemed to sort of cool down. I parked the car and we went into a hotel where we met some friends of ours. Yes? Did you go home after that? No. 
And pretty soon I noticed my wife had disappeared. I started looking for her, and just as I'd got to the side door of the hotel, I saw her get into a taxi with an older man. Oh, and did you recognize him? Well, I suspect very strongly that it was her father. He's been trying to get Grace under his wing so he would have control of her money. I see. Has she got considerable money? Yes, she inherited a great deal from her former husband, who died several years ago. Now, you say you have letters from your wife. Yes. She wrote me a short note a couple of days after she left. It was postmarked here in the city. She said she was going to visit her friend out of town, and she thought that a separation would do us both good. Uh-huh. Is this the only letter you've received? Well, about a week after that, I got a letter from her saying she was in Denver and was on her way to New York. That was about the middle of March, I guess. I got several other letters, and then suddenly she stopped writing. That was about three weeks ago. Here are the letters. Mm-hmm. You sure these letters are in your wife's handwriting? Yes, I'm certain of it. Well, I see nothing particular to worry about yet. The only thing I can advise is for you to do your best to locate her. Of course, you understand the homicide squad is, has no interest in family squabbles unless a murder has been committed. Do you think she may be dead? Well, judging from what you tell me, I imagine she's all right. But if you don't hear from her pretty soon, let me know. I'll sue Lunt. I'll sue the old man for every penny he has in the world. I'll sue him for slander. I'll sue him for alienating my wife's affection. I'll teach him. Now, now, doctor, take it easy. You go on home and cool off and let me know if you hear from your wife. All right, Captain. Sorry I lost my temper, but this has got me worried to death. Well, you won't say anything to the papers about this, will you? Why, no, not if you don't want me to. I would appreciate it. Good day, Captain. Good day. In the next few days, Captain Bean made discreet inquiries about Dr. Young. He learned that he was a successful dentist, well-liked in his profession, and apparently financially successful. Almost a week passed. And Captain Bean received another visitor. Oh, uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Thank you, Captain Bean. Now, what can I do for you? I'm Frank Lunt. My daughter has been missing for more than two months. I haven't heard a word from her. I think she has been murdered. What makes you think so? She was married for her money. Now I think she has been killed for it. Just who did your daughter marry? Dr. Thomas Young. Oh, I see. Go on. I must admit that he has quite a reputation. Seems to be a very capable man. Mr. Lunt, I don't think your daughter is dead. Why not? Because Dr. Young has been getting letters from his wife since she disappeared. What? I don't believe it. Well, here. Here's a package of letters Dr. Young left with me. He's been to see you? Yes, and he seemed very worried about his wife's disappearance. Mm. Uh, May I see those letters? Well, certainly. Is that your daughter's handwriting? Yes, it is. You see, apparently your daughter's just neglected to write to you. You say Dr. Young has been to see you? Yes, and he left those letters. Asked me to help find his wife. Uh, What did he say? He thinks you know where she is, and you're trying to cause a separation. I do want to separate them, but I haven't done it this time. Well, of course you know the homicide squad is not interested in family quarrels. But this isn't just a family quarrel, Captain. When you find my daughter... You'll find her dead. Well, Mr. Lunt, I hope you're wrong. And I believe you are. I've hired detectives to look for her, Captain. And I understand her husband has done the same. But I don't want you to miss any opportunity that might help bring her back to me. Captain Bean was now in a quandary. Began a quiet investigation of both Dr. Young and the missing woman's father. Three weeks passed. Then a man swallowed a tooth and died. That incident in itself was of little account. But it was important in focusing the attention of the authorities upon the mysterious disappearance of Grace Young. For the man who swallowed the tooth was a former deputy city attorney. And the man who pulled the tooth was Dr. Thomas Young. Routine investigation of the case found that Dr. Young was not negligent. But in the mind of Captain Jimmy Bean, there was another thought. He sent for Deputy District Attorney Davis. You want to see me, Jimmy? Oh, yes, Davis. Sit down. Thanks. What's on your mind? You've been investigating Elber Mallet's death, haven't you? And this dentist, Dr. Young. Yes, why? Well, I've been doing a little investigating of Dr. Young myself and his father-in-law, Frank Lunt. Oh? How come? Well, about three weeks ago, they both came to me with a story about Young's wife having disappeared. 
So far, I found out that there's been bitter antagonism between the doctor and his father-in-law for the past four years. Hmm. That was the time the doctor married Lunt's daughter. Wasn't she a Mrs. Brogan? Yes, that's the woman. I found out something else. She has a 17-year-old son who seems deeply attached to his stepfather. But it's the boy and not the mother who inherits the Brogan millions. She is only the administratrix of the estate. I see. What else? Mrs. Young is immensely wealthy in her own right. About a year ago, she drew up a will, leaving her property to her two brothers, a nephew, and her husband, share and share alike. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing unusual in that. The husband gets one-fourth of the estate, and the father doesn't get any. But he has plenty anyway. What's all this leading up to? Well, there isn't any reason in the world to believe that this woman has been murdered except her unexplained absence. Both Dr. Young and her father are firmly convinced that the other one knows where she is. Now, here are some letters that she has written to her husband since her disappearance. Oh, I see. How long ago was this? On uh, the night of February 22nd. Maybe she didn't write these letters. Oh, yes, she did. I've already looked into that. Her checking account uh, hasn't been touched since the night of her disappearance. Oh. You see, I got a sample of her handwriting from the bank, and I've had it compared with these letters. Now, there's no doubt in the world that Mrs. Young wrote them. Well, then it ought to be obvious that she's still alive. Or at least she was on the date this last letter was written. Well, it's up to you, boys, from now on, if you want to do anything about it. There's no reason for my department to start running around looking for a murder and end up finding the whole thing is just a family quarrel. Well, I'll talk to the DA about it and see what he thinks. Davis attacked the case from a new angle and, acting upon orders from his chief, went to the young home. Is Mrs. Young home? Why, no, sir. She ain't been here since, uh, since Washington's birthday. Is Dr. Young home? No, sir. Ain't nobody here but me and a Filipino boy. I'm from the district attorney's office. I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Now, just sit down and make yourself at home, sir. You say you haven't seen Mrs. Young since the 22nd of February? Yes, yeah, sir. If that's Washington's birthday... How do you happen to remember that day? Well, because uh, that's the day Dr. Young called me up and said I don't have to come to work. So my boyfriend done took me to a show. Do you know if Mrs. Young took any bags or trunks or any of her clothing with her? Well, I don't know. I know there was a pretty girl came here after Ms. Young done gone away. She said she'd come to get some of Ms. Young's pretty dresses. Done took away a big armful. Well, why did you let her have them? Well, she done say Dr. Young say it was all right. Well, what did this girl look like? I don't know, except she was awful pretty girl. Was she a blonde or brunette? Well, I don't know, but uh, she had dark hair and blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Was she short or tall? Oh, just about medium. Had you ever seen this woman before? No, sir. He never seen her before. Have you ever seen her since? Yeah, sir. She's been here lots of times since then. Has Dr. Young ever been here when she was? No, sir. He never seen him. All right. Well, you just forget I was here, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Is anything wrong? No, no, I don't think so. I'd just rather you didn't mention that I've been around. Sensing an illicit romance, Davis pondered the question of the mysterious woman who had taken the missing wife's clothing with the doctor's consent. Reasoning that the man would not permit the clothing to be worn unless he knew his wife was not coming back, Davis decided to question the dentist. Good afternoon, sir. Is Dr. Young in? Uh, yes, sir, but he's terribly busy now. Well, bring him in here. I want to talk to him. Oh, yes, sir. Did you wish to see me? Uh, yes, doctor. Alone. That'll be all, Miss Lyon. Dr. Young, I'm Harold Davis of the district attorney's office. And we're conducting a search for Mrs. Young. Well, that's fine. I'm glad you are. I've had private detectives looking for her for weeks now. Have you any idea where she is? No, have you? No, sir, I haven't. What I want to know, Dr. Young, is who took Mrs. Young's clothing from your home shortly after she left. Clothing? I didn't know there was any missing. Where did you learn that? Well, just let that pass for the time being. But you haven't any idea who took the clothing. Possibly. My wife had a friend call for it. Hmm. Possibly. I'll be in in just a minute. Uh, Dr. Young... How did your wife happen to leave you? Do you mind telling me? Why, no. You see, my wife was always influenced by her people. I feel certain that old man Lunt, her father, knows where she is. Oh. I have suspect that my wife is being held against her will. And I think you officers should make him tell what he knows about her disappearance. Well, perhaps you're right. Oh, by the way, have you any idea who might be supplying your wife with money in case she needs it? I understand she didn't have any with her when she left. Oh, yes, she did. She had $100,000 in Liberty Bonds. What? 
$100,000? Yes. Where did she get them? I gave them to her. You gave your wife $100,000 in Liberty Bonds? Yes, sir. And there's the receipt she signed when I gave them to her. Hmm. You mean you got her to sign a receipt for them? Yes, sir. I gave them to her the night she left. And I got her to sign a receipt because, well, I didn't want any of her relatives to accuse me of stealing them. Oh, I see. Hmm. Do you mind if I take this receipt and have it compared with her handwriting? Not at all. Providing I get it back. You'll get it back. Will you excuse me just a minute? I'll see this patient. Right. I'll be right back. All right. Give me Trinity, 2141. Eddie King, please. Hello, Eddie. Look, I'm down at Dr. Young's office. I have a sneaking hunch that his secretary will bear watching. Now grab a car and get down here to 847 South Broadway. Yeah. Watch for a dark-haired, blue-eyed girl about five and a half feet tall. She'll be wearing a pale blue dress. Keep your eyes on her, will you? Well, Mr. Davis, that's taken care of. Is there anything else I can do for you? Well, no, I think not. I may call on you for some more information later on. Davis returned to his office where for an hour he waited for a telephone message. Then together with Investigator King, he drove to the home of Frank Lunt, father of the missing woman. I had the handwriting on that receipt compared by an expert, and he says it's the same as the one on the letters Young received and on Mrs. Young's signature card at the bank. Well, that definitely clears Young, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. Young is in the clear. Well, here we are. Do you think the woman's dead? Oh, I don't know. We'd like to see Mr. Lunt, please. Yes, sir. Um, won't you come in? Thank this you. place seems like a morgue. Yes, I'm beginning to wonder if it is. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You want to see me? Uh, Mr. Lunt, I'm Harold Davis from the district attorney's office. Oh, yes. This is Mr. King. Oh, how do you do? We are conducting a quiet search for your daughter. Oh, I'm glad. Now, do you mind if we ask you some very pointed questions? Not at all. Well, Dr. Young thinks he saw you get into a taxi cab with his wife the night she disappeared. Did you? Absolutely not. Hmm. You knew, of course, that your daughter had $100,000 in Liberty Bonds when she disappeared? She... She had what? $100,000 in Liberty Bonds. Ridiculous. One hundred thousand dollars in Liberty Bonds. Why, she wouldn't be so foolish to carry that much around. Dr. Her. Young gave her the bonds that night. Why, you're joking. That two-bit dentist couldn't raise two thousand dollars, let alone one hundred thousand. I'm afraid you're wrong, Mr. Lunt. Well, possibly. He wouldn't give it to her if he did. On the contrary, your daughter gave her husband a receipt for the bonds. Where is it? Right here. Let me have it. There. Is that your daughter's handwriting? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Have you any ideas about this, Mr. Lunt? No. Grace had liberty bonds of her own, considerably more than 100000 I don't have any idea where she keeps them. But <laughs> that dentist never had and never will have that much money invested in anything. Well, just what do you think has become of your daughter, Mr. Lunt? I came to the conclusion long ago that Dr. Young killed her after they left the plantation in that night. Well, why would he kill her? What possible motive could he have? I don't know. According to Grace's will, he gets only a small portion of her estate... I can't believe he would kill her for that. Neither can we, Mr. Lunt. Well, if you hear from your daughter, will you get in touch with us? Yes. The minute I hear anything, I'll let you know. Davis went straight to the district attorney and laid the facts before him. All right, Davis. If you think you can solve this case, we'll break the story. But if you think you can't... We'd better keep it quiet until we get more evidence. It might be wishful thinking on my part, but I still think we can solve the case. Anyway, I'll need every man you can spare because it's going to take some hard work. You can have as many men as you need. Well, I'd like to have Eddie King keep the doctor and his secretary in sight, and another man to keep track of the lunts, especially the father. Then I'd like to have somebody pick up the trail of Dr. Young at the plantation inn. <laughs> Next morning, the newspapers screamed the sensational story of the missing heiress. Investigators learned that Dr. Young was extremely methodical in his habits, that he was not involved in any love affairs, that he was devoted to his wife. Then an important clue was uncovered by Investigator King. Well, knock your hat off, Chief. That girl in Dr. Young's office has been seen at the gay spots around town wearing Mrs. Young's sable coat and her diamonds. Has Dr. Young been stepping with her? As a 
matter of fact, she hasn't been seen much with Young. She keeps pretty much to herself. But the point is, she's been wearing Mrs. Young's clothing. Oh, bring that girl in. Davis raced to make another check of Mrs. Young's expensive wardrobe at her home. His discoveries convinced him he was following a warm trail. Numerous items of apparel, expensive coats, fragile garments, and priceless jewelry were now found in Mrs. Young's bedroom. All the articles that had been missing when investigators had checked before. Neither the cook nor the Filipino houseboy could explain the mysterious reappearance of the clothing and the jewelry. Within an hour, Mrs. Young's father had identified the returned property as that of his daughter. Police department, please. Homicide detail. Oh, Captain Bean, this is Hal Davis. Will you pick up Dr. Young and bring him to my office right away? Thanks. Oh, come in, Eddie. What'd you find out? The girl is not there, Hal. I had another girl in the building inquire for her. And Dr. Young said that the lion girl had gone to the beach. I was afraid of that. Well, I've got Mrs. Young's boy in the next room. I'm going to talk to him again. You can take care of that other job now. Oh, hello, Pat. Hello, Mr. Davis. Uh, Pat, did Mr. Young ever suggest that you make out a will? Yes, why? You're the heir to your father's fortune, aren't you? Sure. Well, did Dr. Young suggest you make him your beneficiary? Sure. He thought it would be a good idea, and so did I. What's wrong with that? Oh, nothing at all, son. Well, that'll be all. Good night. Good night, Mr. Davis. Oh, if you think Dr. Young killed my mother, you're all wrong. Mom's all right. I know. All right. Good night, son. Hmm. Well. Come in. Dr. Young, Hal. Oh, come in, Jim. Now, sit down, Dr. Young. Well, Mr. Davis, have you found any trace of my wife? No, we haven't, Doctor. Dr. Young, are you in love with your secretary? That's a mighty foolish question to ask. Why has she been wearing your wife's clothing? She borrowed Mrs. Young's clothing in order to make an impression on her boyfriend. She borrowed Mrs. Young's diamond to make him jealous. I loaned my wife's clothing and ring to Miss Lyon, and I returned them to my home when she was through with them. Yes, you did. Listen, no man lends his wife's clothing and jewelry unless he's positive he'll never see his wife again. That's absurd. Or unless he's positive she's dead. Mr. Davis, are you trying to upset me? I'm trying to find out the truth. What is it, Eddie? Here's something that looks very interesting, Chief. Oh, give it to me. Uh-huh. Yes, it does. What is it? A hundred thousand dollars in Liberty Bonds. That I found in Dr. Young's office a few minutes ago. Those bonds, in case you're interested, belong to John Leonard. The father of my deceased first wife. Dr. Young, I believe you are lying. I think these bonds belong to Grace Young. I'm sorry you disbelieve me, but I had nothing whatever to do with my wife's money. No? Why, that's why you killed her. You wanted that money. No, no, that's a lie. Uh, here's something the doctor might explain, Hal. While I was waiting for him to get ready to come here this afternoon with me, I noticed his secretary writing some letters. The note paper you will notice is the same as the paper on which Mrs. Young's letters to the doctor were written. You forgot that Mr. Sellers has already stated that Mrs. Young wrote those letters. Now, excuse me a minute. Hello. Oh. All right, send them in. Mr. Davis? Hi, Mr. Davis. What can I do for you? Oh, oh we saw a story in the paper that you was investigating the Young case. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Young. I, I didn't see you. Uh, do you know this man? Why, sure. That's what me and my partner come up to see you about. You see, about four or five months ago, uh, me and my partner here, we dug a cistern out on his place in Beverly Glen. Yeah? We dug a cistern about uh, ten feet deep, and I guess it must have been, oh, eight and nine feet in width. Uh, Bill, uh, wasn't it about eight feet? Uh, never mind. Oh, what's the rest of the story? Well, uh, when we saw the story in the paper about Mrs. Young, we thought, uh, my partner and me, that... It was just possible that she had stumbled into that pit and accidentally been killed. Accidentally? Yes, sir. You see, that cistern was left open at Dr. Young's request. He, he told us not to finish the job on account of... Uh, he had a filtering system he was going to put into the bottom of the cistern. That hole has been covered up. Pat and I went up there one Sunday and put a cement floor and, and covered the system with boards. I'm positive Mrs. Young didn't fall into the open pit. Well, I just thought it wouldn't hurt to mention it. Uh, she could have stumbled in. Oh, she could have been pushed in and buried alive. No, no, no. no she was dead when... Yes, Doctor? 
You were going to say something else? No. Nothing. Mr. Ramsey, what are you doing tomorrow, you and your partner? I, uh, uh, nothing, I guess, Mr. Davis. Well, tomorrow I want you to dig up the bottom of that cistern. No, no, no. Don't dig it up. I killed her. I'll tell you about it. She was mean to me. She was always shooting off her mouth. I stopped that voice of hers. For years, that voice had been driving me crazy. But I stopped it. I stopped it. I stopped it. In just a moment, you will hear the summation of our story. Dr. Young was brought to trial, where he heard numerous witnesses blast to pieces the cunning framework of a perfect crime. He told how he had plied his wife with drinks the night of the crime, had tricked her into writing the letters to him, how she had signed them, and how he had sent the letters to a friend to be mailed to him at regular intervals. When court was reconvened the last day of the trial, Dr. Young did not appear. During the night, he had fashioned a noose from a radio antenna in his jail cell and had hanged himself. His death proved again that crime does not pay. Calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 243. Suspect has committed suicide. That is all. Gordon. Gordon.